got the timer because I've already dropped my phone and my notes. This is going <laughs> swimmingly. All right, let's try this again. Okay. I'm Stephanie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Stephanie. My sobriety date is September 19th, 2003, and my home group is the Mount Lake Terrace group in Mount Lake Terrace. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I have notes. I've only other, only ever done this one other time, and I've gotten away with not doing it for almost 20 years. So here we are. I uh, My best thinking when I originally, well, first of all, my sponsor asked me to do this, and on her list is you never say no to an AA request. So here we are. I My original thought was I wanted to put on a suit and like do a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> and that sort of thing, because if I can do it that way, I don't really need to focus on what's really going on. And that was one of the things that was absolutely brought out when I did my fourth step. My sponsor was sitting there crying like a little baby. And I'm like, what is going on? Why are you crying? And she's like, because you're not. I was like, oh, because being an alcoholic, you know, I have this great ability to tell a story that's about me, but it's not about me when I'm telling it. So our story started in the 80s. I was born in an alcoholic, dysfunctional home, nothing special there. Um, my sister is six years older than me, and she used to babysit me while my parents were out at the bar. My mom, my dad was a drug dealer, and my mom worked at this restaurant called The Monorail, and so we would go down there and give her the drugs so she could sell them. And uh, Eventually, they just got tired of bringing the kids to the bar because we weren't well behaved. And so again, my sister would be forced to babysit me. And my sister realized fairly quickly the best way to control a five-year-old is to give them some alcohol and send them night night. And so that's what I did. I drank, not consciously. I wasn't an alcoholic at five, I think. We'll discuss that later, but... <laughs> But uh, one of the things she did when I wasn't behaving was uh, she got me drunk and she tied me to a chair and she stuck a sock in my mouth and put me in front of the TV to watch The Shining. Oh. So I, I've watched the movie since then. I've worked through my trauma, but that was just like what it was like at my house. My parents were alcoholics both of them. My dad was, of course, abusive. I was proficient at calling 911. And I will never forget, there was one time that they came in, the police came into the house and my dad, I still see it in my head. My dad was sitting by the fireplace, smoking a cigarette. They walk in and he's like, just let the bitch die. And I mean, he partially wasn't wrong because she just kept doing it, you know? And then uh, I had one thing in the world I loved. I loved this cat. He was a black cat and his name was Garfield. And it was the only thing in the entire world that I had. And I was at my grandma's one weekend and I didn't get to come home for a long time. And then finally I got to come home and my mom and dad sat me down and told me that Garfield had been hit by a car. And I just like, I had my first psychotic episode as a child. <laughs> I just like completely lost my shit, tried to run through a plate glass door, you know. They ended up bringing me to the a hospital where they could just knock me the fuck out. Sorry, knock me out. But I knew, I knew in that moment there absolutely was no God because he took the only thing that I loved from me. Oh, so then let's fast forward a little bit. Um, All right, my dad is gone. Let's just say my dad is gone. And uh, he was asked to leave for several reasons and he also got to go visit a facility for a few years, but he was gone. And uh, we were all in therapy and we were sitting there in therapy one day and they had asked uh, how long my mom and dad had been married. And I don't remember anymore what my mom said. And I said, nah, -uh, my sister's, you know, this old. And that's when my mom told me right there in that meeting that my sister was not actually my sister. She was my half sister. And that was another moment that was just like, you know, everything's a lie. 
And I knew at that moment that I had to get out of the house. And so when I turned 13, nobody ever threw me out of the house. I didn't want to be there. I left. I walked out the front door and I never went back. And uh, during that time, you know, when you're 13 and you leave home, not a lot of great things are going to happen to you and you're going to make a lot of stupid decisions and you're going to walk around and pretend that you're an adult, but you're not an adult. You're really a stupid fucking kid. But a lot of adult things will happen to you and bad things. And so uh, I was sitting in, I of course wound up in an alternative school, summer school, all the things, you know, and I was sitting in class one day and I'll never forget these vivid memories that are so stupid. But uh, I had written this poem on my desk because, you know, that's really smart. And it was like, let me die. Just set me free, you know. And uh, one of the teachers saw it and they called me down to the office, which was great because uh, I spent a lot of time in the office. So I'm in the office. I walk in. They shut the door behind me and the guys in the jacket strap me down on the, I almost said stroller, on the thingy. And out I go in front of the entire hospital in front of the entire high school. And I was awarded 180 days by the great state of Washington to be incarcerated and help with my mental health. That would be awesome if I got the help that I needed. But my mom loves me. So my mom would come and pick me up and take me out on passes and get me stoned. So I'm, you know, at the time taking all these like psychiatric drugs. I'm not, I mean, there's no drugs in there. We weren't sneaking drugs in or anything like that. I mean, if anything, we were like trading pills, but here's my mom coming and taking me out and getting me stoned. And so I didn't really learn a lot in that situation. And uh, another long story short, but for the rest of my time, I wound up in different foster homes. And then when I was 17, I finally had some ID and uh, got an apartment. And then I was done, done with the system, with everyone trying to help me and everything else. And then I had this boyfriend. He was great. He was honestly like the, no, for real. Like he was the best thing that ever happened to me. He was pretty normal. He was kind. He never hit me. I beat the shit out of him. He never, you know, called me names, any of that. And uh, one night I was drunk and throwing a fit. And one of the neighbors called the police because they thought he was hitting me when <laughs> it was cute little me. Anyway, so the cops come in the house, you know, and they're like, what's going on? So we explain the situation. And I used to be skinnier a long time ago, but I start yelling, take me to jail, motherfucker. Take me to jail. And guess what? <laughs> they took me. <laughs> so I wake up, you know, in my cell on the floor with Kool-Aid stuck to my face and a bologna sandwich and an apple. Anyways. So, of course, my mom comes and bells me out. And at the time, my mom was working for um, the Bellevue Police Department. So she's getting all these really good ideas. So she calls the police and says that I assaulted her, but I was nowhere near her house. I was nowhere there at all. And they came and arrested me and put me in a cell when I never touched the woman. But no one cared what I had to say because I had a prior and I'm a drunk and all the things. So I ended up getting sentenced to anger management. I had met this woman, we had, you know, taking all these classes and blah, blah, blah. And they said something about, you know, who was your worst enemy? And I was like, that's an easy answer. That's me. I'm my worst enemy. And so this woman comes up to me asking, and she was like, you know, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous and then, 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 then. And I was like, good for you, you know, but for some reason I kept her number and I kept it in my pocket or in my wallet. And then, uh, I was, oh, my mom has a lot to do with this, but that's another meeting. But, uh, I was over at my mom's house and I was one of those people that you get drunk and you like run off and you come back with a giraffe. That was me. So I was out and I was at my mom's house. I'm getting completely drunk. And for some reason I decided it was time to go. No idea why, but I just left. So I'm walking down the street and truly it's God's grace because I was a massive tomboy. So I had on like champion shorts and a blue tank top and these Converse and I'm hitchhiking. 
And a man who, you know, again, I praise God every day because I was good murder material there. But uh, he actually brought me to my house. And I got in the house and I called this woman. And I still laugh about this part because she's like, where are you? And I told her, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, well, can you drive? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was funny when I heard Travis talking because uh, I met her at Hilltop in Bellevue. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. It was a Sunday. I cannot tell you what the meeting was about. I cannot tell you what was said. I cannot tell you who was there because I was really drunk. But I just sat there and cried and cried and cried the entire time. And I managed to put about three years together. But there were a lot of things that I managed not to do. Part of my talk is titled, you know, what not to do in AA. But the working title is call your sponsor. So, uh, so like I said, I ended up putting about three years together. The man that was so nice to me, I married him. And I loved him. And I loved him so much that I was sitting there one day in front of the TV. Actually, let's back up. I also had a male sponsor because I have a lot of issues. So I always had a male sponsor. And when I did marry this man, um, he bought me a phone as a wedding present because he said maybe now I'd be able to call him. Didn't work. So back to the working title. But uh, So I married this man. And I was sitting in front of the TV one day. And I'm watching our wedding video and I'm just sitting there crying and crying and I'm sober, you know, three years sober and I'm just crying, crying, carrying on. And I, I realized in that moment that if something happened to him, I would not be okay. After everything that I'd been through, I did not know if something happened to him, if I could pick up the pieces and move on. So I did what any raging normal dry alcoholic would do. And I packed up all my shit and I moved out. He had no idea why, no idea why. When you talk about being blindsided, that was him. Shock, total shock. But the cruelty that I'm capable of, and the truth is that's one person that I have never made amends to because to show up in his life would be way too painful. So I've had to use other avenues to do that. So anyways, I continued drinking. Let's be shocked. And I spent another five years drinking. But this time I married someone who has never even smoked a joint in their life. <laughs> yeah. So this one was going to save me from myself too. He was always taking care of me. And uh, we used to have this Clearly, we're not married anymore. But anyways, we used to have this beach house. And uh, I was pushing my little girl. She wasn't even two yet. I was pushing her back and forth on a log. And she fell off the log. But his uncle was there, too. And I'm crying and crying because I'm drunk and I can't find her. But the uncle finds her. And so at the same time, I had this best friend that I had met in one of those foster homes. And uh, her sobriety date was September 19th, and she was two years ahead of me. So we decided in that moment that September 19th was going to be my date. So I got to spend the rest of the summer drinking, and I did. And September 18th, up until 11.59 at night, I drank my ass off. And at 11.59 on September 18th, I set down the drink. And I didn't have to do that again. And I haven't done that again. So after I got sober this time, the second time, I went through sponsors like Kleenex. And Ashri kind of ruined my story a little bit. But uh, my friend, <laughs> my friend Shelly's like, you need to ask this woman to be your sponsor. I was like, okay, you know, I've just gone through so many of them. It didn't matter to me. So I go to Austria and I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm so low maintenance. I really don't need a lot at all. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, she gives me this pamphlet, of course, that I'm supposed to read the questions and answers on sponsorship. And I'm supposed to highlight it. 
and then meet her. And so when you, you still argue with me on this point, but uh, when I met her, we w had coffee and went through it and I asked her to be my sponsor and she said no. And I was like, what? Because you wanted me to give an account as to why I drank again. How did that happen? And you know, I had to do a lot of self-reflection and take a look at that. Well, first of all, I'm an alcoholic, but there was one major, I didn't tell her this in this meeting, of course, because I'm a liar, but there was one thing, a really, really, really big thing that I had left off on my forcep. And when that thing put its ugly head out of the ground, that was the last straw for me to drink. And so I did. I mean, clearly I had bad behaviors leading up to that, but yeah, that was the final straw that I drank. So then, yeah, you're going to see a pattern here. So I had 90 days sober and I had met this man and he had 10 years sober and he was like a God to me. Like, oh my gosh, how do you get 10 years? And I had actually known him from Hilltop. And so when I got sober again and oh my gosh, he was still there and he'd stayed sober and you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, he had two kids. I had two kids. So we formed this beautiful Brady bunch of kids. We were together six years and uh, we got married. Yes, I know. So uh, <laughs> it's two weeks before Christmas. And I can tell you the exact spot that I was in my car and what I was wearing because I get a phone call from his girlfriend's husband letting me know they were having an affair. And my whole entire world shattered in that moment. I had to rethink a lot of things. Uh, I had to go back. At that time, I never felt like I was going to drink because of everything that he'd taken from me. There was absolutely no way in hell he was going to get that too. But we were both in the program. So walking through that was very hard. I would walk into a meeting and they'd be like, where's blah, blah. And I'm like, why don't you ask blah, blah. There was a place that uh, we had gotten sober together, or not together, but where we had met. And uh, when all of this happened, he had gone down to the meeting and was sitting there and someone goes up to him and they're like, oh, what's wrong? And he's like, well, Stephanie's divorcing me. Yeah, Stephanie's divorcing you, but you kind of left out some things, you know? And so it was about a year, six, six months, a year of walking through that and him telling one version of the story and me knowing the truth and keeping my mouth shut because it wasn't my story to tell. And uh, two years ago, he was found dead. He had committed suicide. He was drunk and took a bunch of fentanyl, left a note. And that was the end of him. And that's how that ended for him. But I stayed sober and I helped his kids with the funeral and I helped his kids have him cremated and I helped his son buy a condo and I've been there for his kids because those kids did nothing wrong. So after that, obviously, there was a lot of therapy, <laughs> some Al-Anon, not enough, asked my sponsor, but uh, I've really, you know, what it's like now, like, I celebrated 20 years in September. We're, we're pretty close to, you know, my birthday coming up again. I know who my friends are. That's been huge. Because when that whole thing happened, I found out who my friends were. And uh, during this time, it actually just came up in my Facebook memories. My dad had died 14 years ago. It's almost been 14 years next month. But uh, he drank himself to death. I got a phone call from a, a hospital and I thought it was for my mom, which is so funny. So I was like, screw you guys, you know, I'll deal with it later. And then they called like three times and finally they said my dad's name. So I was like, oh crap. So uh, he had had a stroke. He, he was drunk. 
He got up to get another beer. He had a stroke, hit his head on the coffee table and laid there for three days before they found him. So when I first got to the hospital, he was paralyzed on the right side of his body. And they're like, you know, we got to look at rehab places, blah, blah, blah. Well, the DTs were too fast. When I woke up the next morning, I got the phone call that this is it. And, you know, out of everything I've been through in my life, one of the top five saddest things was having the priest come in and read him his last rites and being there and watching his face of him knowing that he was going to die. This was it. And watching him. And uh, ultimately, I was the one to unplug him and I ended his life. So my circle is tight. My circle is very tight. And uh, one of the things that I know where I was going with that, sorry, I started crying, then I was like, I'm not going to cry. And then I went on to another subject, but now we're going to go back really quick because my dad's funeral. When uh, the funeral came, there were people from AA that showed up. And I was like, what are you doing here? You don't know my dad. And they're like, yeah, he's dead. We're here for you. And I, that was a concept that I did not understand because my whole life is about, you know, suit up and show up and do the next indicated thing. And what would you be doing right now if this thing hadn't happened? And that's what I was doing. And my friends showed up for me when I didn't even know that I needed them to be. And, uh, I understand now what it means to share my experience, strength and hope, not just in AA, you know, there's, there's other ways. My story has a lot of turns and twists and stuff. So, so I have been able to do that. I mean, when my son is in speech therapy and there's a woman that, uh, her kid goes too, and we were talking the other day and it turns out her husband was cheating and there was like this whole thing, you know? And so I was like, you know, this is how you walk through this. This is, you know, how you carry yourself. This is how you worry about you. And then she, she doesn't know about me, but she tells me her husband's an alcoholic and he has 10 years sober. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, then I got to send her, you know, some text messages and some meetings. And he has since started going to one of those meetings that I had sent her to tell him about. So, you know, you, you just never know how you show up in the world. That's for sure. And uh, the other thing is I haven't drank no matter what. Three husband. <laughs> None of them get to see me drink. No, uh, you know, my dad dying, my stepdad died. I mean, I could just go on and on and on with the sob stories. My mom is still a practicing alcoholic and drug addict. And every day is a struggle with that one. She's the mean kind that will just randomly send you a hateful <laughs> message because she feels like it. I haven't been giving her enough attention. So my birthday was a few days ago and she sent me a card and all it said was mom. So I sent her a lovely message and said, thank you so much for the card. I even managed to get the mail on my birthday so I could get it today. She didn't respond. My sister is also an alcoholic. She, uh, got a DUI in a school zone picking up my, I don't know how it works out, but she got a DUI picking up my niece's daughter from school. So she went to the carpool line and was drunk, rear-ended another car in the carpool line and the cops came, arrested my sister. And so my niece got to watch my sister be arrested in front of the entire school. So I do sometimes go down the dark road of going, why am I sober? Why am I special? What have I done? My dad is dead. My mom, I don't know how that woman's still alive. I think she's a cat. My sister, also an alcoholic. My niece, also an alcoholic. And she actually started coming to our meeting a little bit ago. And uh, she's California sober now. She's got two years, but you know what? I'll take it. Hopefully, you know, when she's ready to deal with the marijuana, she will. But there's little headways being made. And uh, my other niece actually messaged me a couple days ago, and I had to get up out of the meeting and talk to her. Uh, she's married to an alcoholic, and he's very abusive. And I said, of course you are. You're surrounded by them. We're everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's all she's ever known. And uh, I try and tell them. 
You know, there, there is hope. There's a way out. I got out. I stayed out. I don't know how. I, I did every direction Ashri told me to do. And yeah, she left out the best part. So I used to call her. And I knew when she was at work and when she was at home. So I would call her and I would say, hello, I'm alive, goodbye. And I would hang up. And if I wanted to talk to her, you know, I'd call her at a different time. But uh, one day I was, I was living in Oregon. I was working in Oregon. And uh, I called Austria and I said, hello, I'm alive, goodbye. And I hung up. And, you know, Austria's like, we don't chase anybody. So she called me back and I was like, why are you calling me back? And she's like, do you know why I had you call me every day? I'm like, yeah, because you're a control freak. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she says, I know the sound of your voice. So what's going on? And in that moment, I knew she was someone that I could trust and someone that really loved me because the direction, I'm not going to cry, because the direction that she gave me ultimately was for me. It wasn't for her. She's not a control freak. She could give two shits less whether I stay sober or not, because guess what? She's going to stay sober. And that's something I've had to learn along the way. And like she said, I did follow every direction. And I did do that for like seven years because I didn't understand that I could stop. <laughs> she gave me the direction and I never heard her say 90 days because I'm an alcoholic and I'm crazy so you know I just kept doing it and my kids would call me and they would say hello I'm alive goodbye and hang up and they had no idea what it was about my kids didn't know I was an alcoholic or that you people existed till they were probably 13 14 years old they didn't remember me being drunk and it was a part of my life that I really kept hidden from them because I wanted them to have as normal of life as possible. My son finally realized uh, his grandma was an alcoholic and this is another great story. We were uh, walking down the street one day to go get some milk at the store. And he's like, yeah, sometimes grandma acts really weird. And then he says, and her bathroom smells like the bathroom at the Judas Priest concert. <laughs> <laughs> And in that day, my son realized who grandma was. And at that point, I had to have a serious conversation with them and make sure they understood who grandma was. And their time going to grandma's house and spending the night came to an end. Because silly me, I thought she was managing to behave for that 24 hours, but I was wrong. So both of my older kids are not alcoholics. It's kind of crazy to me. My daughter barely drinks. My son likes to pretend he drinks, and he's like, yeah, I got so drunk last night. I had six beers. I'm like, you go, Noah, you know. <laughs> and uh, we went out. My other, my daughter moved to Mississippi, and they came over. She, she came, and my son came, and we all went out to dinner and got margaritas. And, and not me, obviously, but Noah had two. Oops. <gasps> my son had two margaritas. And he was drunk and they weren't even doubles. And so we had to stay at the restaurant another hour. And I'm like, I'm not worried about you anymore. You know, <laughs> they're not like me. And I thank God for that every day because, you know, we talk about, are you born with it? Is it Maybelline? What the fuck is it? You know, but my kids are not following in my footsteps and I can guarantee you and they will guarantee you. I'm not just making it up that their childhood was 100% better than mine, 100%. And they didn't even experience 10% of the badness. My daughter got mouthy and I took her door off her room, but so what, you know, she didn't get beat. <laughs> there was no blood and there were no police. So yeah, I'm almost done and I guess that's it. I just, I haven't drank no matter what and that's the secret sauce, I don't know. <laughs> That's all I got. Thanks,